Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You know, offense is like that spiritual hangnail that keeps us from really loving people. And when we've got unforgiveness, or I'm really trying to not even talk about unforgiveness tonight. I want to talk what I think precedes it. I, I want to talk about these little hangnail things that I think we get that we don't pay any attention to that then actually become bigger problems in our life. And they affect our relationship with God. They affect our prayers. They affect our worship. But because we don't deal with the little stuff. How many of you agree that sometimes we just don't deal with, because we think it's no big deal. Well, that, well, well, you offended me. It's not my fault that I'm offended. You offended me. <laughs> But you know what? Here's the thing. Each and every one of us, we have to take responsibility for our own lives. It's my responsibility before God to receive his grace to not be offended. I don't care if you did try to offend me. And even if you tried to do it on purpose, I have to be responsible not to take that. And what we do is we blame how we feel on everybody else. Well, yeah, I'm offended, but you offended me. I don't need to change. You need to change. You need to always make me feel good. Then I won't ever get mad. <laughs> did you ever notice that no matter what people did, it didn't bother Jesus at all? I mean, they could reject him. He didn't care. Deny him. Abuse him. Go to sleep on him when he needed them to pray with him for just a little while. Never bothered him. You know why? One simple reason. He knew where he came from. He knew who he was. And he knew where he was going. And when every person on the planet can learn that, the devil's party is over. Amen. Know who you are in Christ. That is the most important thing that you can ever know. Your value should not be determined by how somebody else has treated you. Come on, somebody needs to hear that tonight. Your value should not be determined by how somebody else has treated you. And one more time, your value should not be determined by how somebody else has treated you. <laughs> Let's look at Mark 11, 22. Scriptures that you may be familiar with, but nonetheless worth looking at. Just one little quick thing in here about how all this anger and offense stuff affects our prayers. I mean, if you're going to pray, you ought to pray prayers that can get answered. You all agree with that, right? <laughs> you know what the Lord put on my heart at the beginning of this year, and I've already preached this message, but, so I can't preach it here, but very simply, this is what came into my heart. If you're going to complain about something, Joyce, don't bother to pray about it. <laughs> okay, then. Because <laughs> God's not in charge of the complaint department. <laughs> He answers prayers, not complaints. And if I pray, then I go complain. I'm in essence saying, God didn't hear me and he's not going to do anything about it anyway, so I might as well just keep complaining about it. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, uh-oh, with thanksgiving. We need to get some thank you power back in our lives. Amen. Verse 22, and Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Amen. Amen. For this reason, I'm telling you, this gets better and better. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you, and you will get it. Amen. Amen. And whenever you stand praying, <laughs> if you have anything against anyone...
if you have any little spiritual hangnails, forgive him. Let it drop. Leave it. Let it go. <laughs> Let's rewind. <laughs> and whenever you stand praying, <laughs> if you have anything against anyone, the car repair place, the grocery store, <laughs> your boss, your coworker, your neighbor, somebody in your family. It ain't really going to do you any good to be mad at the government. That's not going to change them. In case anybody feels a little sluggish tonight, let me put it plain. If we want verse 22, 23, 24, 25 to work, we got to do 26. <laughs> and when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, very simple, he says, drop it. Leave it. Walk away from it. I can't mess with that. Champions refuse to be offended. They will not live in offense. David, the little shepherd boy who became king, he had many opportunities to be offended, starting with the fact that when Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to anoint a new king, seven brothers passed before him. Surely it'll be Eliab, the eldest, not the right one. Surely it will be Abinadab, not the right one. Surely to be Shammah, not the right one. Seven passed before him. The prophet said, none of these are right. Don't you have any other children? <laughs> well, yeah, there's David. <laughs> the little shepherd boy, he's out in the field. They didn't even bother to bring David in to be considered. <laughs> oh, how offended we get when we're not even considered. <laughs> When nobody even considers us. Nobody considers our feelings. Nobody considered that they weren't inviting us. Nobody included us. Nobody cared how we felt. From the very beginning, before he ever even received the anointing, come on, he got a test. He got a test. And you know what I think is just lay down on the floor, kick your feet funny? <laughs> when the prophet anointed him, he did it right in front of the seven brothers. God doesn't see like man sees. God sees the heart. And we better be careful when we start having opinions about who God uses. Come on now. Why didn't God just go do it quietly? So why didn't the prophet just get the kid, take him somewhere privately, anoint him and say, hey, someday you're going to be king. Don't tell anybody. No, he did it in front of the seven brothers. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I bet they were seething. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who does he think he is? And that was proven a little bit later when in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David wanted to go see the battle with Goliath because he could not figure out why none of these soldiers were offering to fight Goliath. He didn't get it because he knew that God would fight with him. He knew that. See, the reason why he was anointed to be king was because he knew God. He knew God. He knew who he was. He knew he could trust him. And you know why he knew God? Because he'd been away from the people and out in the field by himself with the sheep long enough to get to know God really well. Don't ever complain when you're lonely. Take it as a time to get to know God. Amen. So, 
David wanted to go see the battle. And he was talking to the oldest son, Eliab. And Eliab said, huh, with whom have you left those few sheep that you tend? <laughs> Annoying little smart aleck. What was he trying to do? He was trying to diminish David. He didn't want him to think that he had any worth and value because he didn't want him to go do anything that might seem to be important. Well, with whom have you left those few sheep? Don't let anybody diminish you. Don't let anybody minimize you or make you feel little. Oh, you mean you're just a stay-at-home mother? No, I am a stay-at-home mother. I am raising giants for God. Oh, you mean you just clean homes for other people? No, I am a servant of the living God. God has given me a gift of helps, and I enjoy doing what God has called me to do. Don't let people minimize you and make you feel little because you're not doing something the world thinks is big because God doesn't see the way the world sees. You know, the only thing that God cares about, are you doing the part that God has asked you to do? If you're doing the part that God has asked you to do, then you are equal to anybody else doing anything. Doesn't matter. David was just out doing what God wanted him to do, just doing the part that God wanted him to do. And lo and behold, he was picked to be king. If you're just doing the part that God wants you to do, you never know when God may come and nab you for something greater. Amen? So anyway, Eliab, with whom have you left those few sheep? I know your heart. You just came here to see the battle. And it's... It says it in 1 Samuel 16. David looked at Eliab and said, what have I done now? You know what that tells me? He was used to that, to, to that. He was used to those brothers ragging on him all the time and giving him a hard time. You know, sometimes older siblings resent the baby because the baby has a tendency to get petted a little bit. And he doesn't have it as hard as the older ones did. Well, you got everything easy and I had to work for everything I've got. Well, that's just the way it is in birth order, baby. Just, <laughs> just, just go for it. You know? By the time the baby comes along, mom and dad have got a little more money. They've learned a little bit. You know, It's the last one they're going to have. And so David was the baby. With whom have you left those few sheep? And <laughs> I know your heart. I know the wickedness of your heart. He said, what have I done now? And then I love this. I love this. The very next verse says, and David turned away from Eliab. So powerful. Champions refused to take offense. He refused to take offense. He got tested. He got tested again. You think you're going to do something for God and never get tested? A lot of the situations that you get in that you think are so demonic, God has plopped you right in the middle of that situation just to see if you've got what it takes to go to the next level. Champions refuse to be offended. They will not take offense. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, leave your gift at the altar and go and first make peace with your brother, then come back and offer your gift to God. God doesn't want us offering him worship or, or trying to give him our acts of service or, or anything else if we're going to come with offense in our hearts. Now, let's talk a minute about covering offenses. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins in 1 Peter 4, 8. Love covers a multitude of sins. What in the world does that mean? To cover means to conceal, to close, to hide, or to keep a secret. Hmm. Genesis 9, 22. Now, Noah, after the ark docked and they were able to get out of it, they planted some vineyards and he drank too much wine and got drunk and was laying in his tent naked. 
The Bible's pretty graphic, you know what? <laughs> Verse 21, and he drank of the wine and he became drunk and he was uncovered and lay naked in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, who was one of the sons of Noah, glanced at and saw the nakedness of his father and went out and told his two brothers. <laughs> Dad's in there drunk, don't have his clothes on. Come check this out. <laughs> so Shem and Japheth, I love this, took a garment laid it upon their shoulders of both of them and went backward into the tent and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces went backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now his nakedness just represents his wrongdoing. So one son uncovered it by telling it. Two sons went in and covered him. Now if you go ahead and read this, the one son who told it and uncovered it and blabbed it to other people got a curse put on him. The two sons that covered their father were both individually blessed by their father. We can receive a blessing from God just if we are willing to not tell the bad things that we see other people do, but pray for them, zip our lip, and cover their offense. My, my, my. So I'm going to pray for myself right now. Father. In Jesus' name, I pray that you'd forgive me for every time that I have told somebody else something that uncovered a person's weakness. I ask you to completely forgive me and give me a fresh start. Now, who else needs that prayer? Yeah. Father, I pray for all of us that you'd forgive all of us <laughs> for uncovering our brothers and sisters' weaknesses for telling their secrets, for going to other people and telling them what they've done. Forgive us, God. Help us not to do it in the future and give us a brand new start. Amen. Now, nobody needs to be condemned. We got a fresh start, but this is important. We just get the biggest perverted kick out of telling stuff, don't we? <laughs> Q won't believe. <laughs> you just won't believe. Can you believe it? <gasps> I can't believe it. You are not going to believe. And the sad thing is, is every time somebody tells something, you get a little bit added to it. By the time it gets through 20 people, man. Love covers a multitude of sins. Let's look at Matthew 18, 15. We doing okay? Oh, this is so important. I hope somebody gets this. Matthew is telling people how to deal with people who have offended you or there's something between you and them that needs to be settled. And he says, if your brother wrongs you, go and show him his fault between you and him privately. <laughs> if he listens to you, you've won back your brother. Then he goes on and he says, if he won't listen, then go to two others. And then if he won't listen, take it to the church. So there's a pattern there to follow. But honestly and truly, I believe that most of the time, most people go tell somebody else. They never get around to going to the brother, but they tell all kinds of other people. I wonder how much trouble would be avoided if we would just go to somebody ourselves and say, you know what, I'm, this is bugging me, so we just need to talk about it. I may be totally wrong. You probably didn't even, maybe you didn't even mean anything by it, but the devil keeps annoying me with it, so I'd just like to talk to you about it. And... 
I would say a large majority of the time, things could be settled right there. But we cause so many problems when we keep going to other people, telling them, telling them, telling them, telling them, telling them. And here's the thing. This is not about anybody feeling condemned. There's no condemnation of those in Christ. This is just about so we can come up higher and enjoy more of the great life that Jesus has planned for us. Man, I want to carry a strong anointing on my life. I want every blessing that I can possibly have. We need more and more of God's grace, His undeserved favor, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us really handle situations with people in a biblical, godly way and not just in a carnal, fleshly way. And the only way that I know to help people is to confront the problem and say, hey, if you're not doing this, that's wonderful. Yay. But if you are, or if you're even tempted to, then please take this word of truth. Don't go away condemned, but say, man, God, I needed that. I am so grateful that you brought that out because I didn't even know I was doing it. How many times do we not even know that? Let me ask you a question. How many of you know sitting right where you're sitting tonight, and those of you watching by TV, you can slip your little hand up too, and you got a benefit. Nobody's going to see you. We're going to see these people. <laughs> How many of you would say that you know where you're sitting right now, that you walked in here tonight with some offense in your heart somewhere, but you really didn't even see or understand what a problem it was until hearing what I've said. Let, let's see your hand. Okay, well, you know what? That is, as far as I can tell, about 98% of the people. That's why we need to preach these kinds of things. Because God sent His Son to die for us that we might have and enjoy our life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And I love being confronted by the truth. I love a word that helps me improve. I love a word that prods me to a higher level. Love covers a multitude Amen. of sins. Amen. Love is not touchy. Love is not fretful. Love is not resentful. People easily offended are selfish. Because anytime they don't get their way, they get offended. People easily offended are insecure. Their love tank is empty, and when they don't get their way, they feel rejected. People easily offended are negative. They always believe the worst when they should believe the best. People easily offended are an easy mark for Satan. He baits the trap, and they take the bait every time. <laughs> People easily offended are miserable because being offended makes you more miserable than it does the person or the thing you're offended at. Being easily offended hinders God's plan for that person's life. They cannot go forward with wrong things in their heart. They have stumbled and fallen. People that are easily offended are unwise. Anytime God tells us in his word not to do something and we do it anyway, it is unwise. People that are easily offended are not free because anybody that is angry is not free. If we are angry, we are not free. That anger is controlling us. We pay a high price for something that's useless, don't we? Everybody say, offense is useless. Champions refuse to be offended. You know, it's really important that we learn to recognize and resist the temptation to be offended if we want to have God's peace, joy, and power in our lives. Remember, if we allow ourselves to be offended, we hinder God's plan for us in every area of life.
But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, it's really great to have the ability to feed children all around the world. And I have a goal and a desire to keep feeding more and more all the time. This after-school feeding program serves an average of 90 to 100,000 hot meals per One year. One meal for these kids is, is survival. Well, I'm here in Thailand at one of our children's homes. You can feed, house, and educate a child. Hope Cambodia has been absolutely amazing. We've opened 15 different orphanages. And we're so grateful to be able to build this well here in Sri Lanka. We love to get clean drinking water to people. Well, so the water they're drinking is not making their children sick, and it's, it's not dirty, contaminated water. <laughs> definitely feel in Haiti just the absolute desperation. I'm at the Cure Hospital in Malawi, Africa. A huge line of people who are waiting to see our nurses and our doctors. Many doctors and medical people have volunteered their time. We are in Summers Point, New Jersey. Well, today we're, we're in Joplin, Missouri. We're here in Haiti in the village, and we're about to move people into brand new houses we've built. The winds were so constant with these big, big gusts. It was terrifying. 150 or more were killed. Thousands left homeless. Hey, you there, guys? Uh, those gifts from Joyce Ride Ministries. Here in Zimbabwe, I was able to hand out the two millionth bag in a prison. That you can't have a different life today. Don't know how many, you know, lives you guys save by coming in and showing the love that you guys show. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is, this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change, you can get healing, you can survive. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelfs af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand.